We are honored to have Dr. Andrew Goy give today's lecture. Andrew obtained his PharmD degree from Utrecht University in the Netherlands, where he also completed a PhD focused on clinical pharmacokinetics of herb drug interactions in oncology. Andrew is also a clinical pharmacologist certified by the Dutch Society of Clinical Pharmacology and Biopharmacy. After receiving his PhD, Andrew completed a three-year postdoctoral fellowship in my lab at the National Cancer Institute, where he conducted research spanning the entire drug development pipeline from drug discovery via target identification and validation to preclinical development and ultimately clinical evaluation. During a second postdoctoral fellowship in the Netherlands, he specialized in the field of pharmacogenetics and oncology. In 2019, he joined Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center in Buffalo, New York, as an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics. We're excited to have him give today's lecture. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Gui. Today, I'll talk about the chemical analysis of drugs and metabolites in biological systems. This is also called bioanalysis. One hour is way too short to cover this, this field in full detail but I hope that after this lecture, you'll have a flavor of the basic concepts and applications of bioanalysis. So first I'll discuss with you uh, the definition of bioanalysis and its main uh, applications. Then I will discuss with you how chromatographic assays and ligand binding assays are developed. During the next section, I will guide you through the validation process of these assays. And at the very end, I'll show you a real life example of a method that we developed and validated at uh, the bioanalytical uh, metabolomics and pharmacokinetic shared resource at Russell Park. Now, the definition of bioanalysis is shown over here. It's a subdiscipline of analytical chemistry that deals with the quantitation of xenobiotics, such as drugs and endogenous compounds in biological systems like humans or animals. Measuring drug levels is important in various areas. For example, in drug development, um, when you're doing preclinical studies, um, you very often need to characterize the metabolism of the drug in, for example, human liver microsomes or in animals. But also later on in clinical testing, um, drugs, uh, the pharmacokinetics of drugs also need to be characterized in humans in phase one pharmacokinetic studies. Also in clinical practice, drug assays are needed, for example, when therapeutic drug monitoring needs to be carried out in which uh, you will assess if the patient is receiving the optimal dose. And forensic science and anti-doping are also other areas for which drug assays are needed. Now, before a bioanalytical assay can be used for any of these applications, it needs to go through the stages of method development and validation. During method development, um, you will optimize the processes that uh, concern extraction, separation, and detection of the analyte. And during method validation, you need to prove that the method is suited to the analysis of your study samples. So let me first talk about chromatographic um, assay development. A chromatographic assay um, consists of several uh, stages, sample preparation, analyte separation, and analyte detection. Before starting uh, method development, it's important to um, consider several factors. For example, uh, what information do you have on your analyte? Uh, are you dealing with a small molecule or a large molecule? What are the physical chemical properties? For example, how polar is a drug? Is it charged or not? And how stable is it under high temperatures? Also, it is always good to know if there is information on the metabolism of the drug. For example, if there are any active metabolites, then these should also be included in your assay. Um, information on the expected concentration in your study samples is also very handy because this will determine the um, concentration range of your assay. 
which runs from the lower limit of quantization up to the upper limit of quantization. The um, matrix is also an important factor. Do you need to measure the drug in plasma, serum, or urine? Because some matrices contain more uh, components that may be interfering with your detection method. Therefore, the type of matrix will dictate which sample preparation method you should use. Sample volume is another important factor, and you should also always do literature research to see if there are any uh, other published methods on your analyte, because this could give you a good starting point on um, you know, how and where to start your, your essay development. Then there are also practical factors to consider, for example, um, on the workload. Um, how many samples do you expect to be run within, you know, within an analytical run? If you have a high number of samples, then a 96 well played format needs to, is, is very handy. Otherwise, you can just use uh, the micro centrifuge tubes. How frequent will you receive samples and also throughput and turnaround time is an important factor, especially uh, for an essay used in clinical practice, where very often the turnaround time needs to be very fast. So therefore the sample preparation method and also the chromatographic runtime should also be as short as possible. Then your lab resource are also uh, it's also an important factor. What type of equipment uh, do you have in your lab? Do you have UV detectors or do you have mass spectrometers? Are there any automatic, automated liquid handling devices available? And also a very important factor was the expertise and the experience of the people in the lab, because this often dictates which sample preparation method is being used. Now, as said, uh, chromatographic assays consist of the stages listed uh, over here. Um, in the following section, I'll discuss uh, uh, first the sample preparation methods that are out there. Sample preparation is needed because very often you cannot simply inject your biological sample into your chromatographic system. Because if you do this, you will clog the chromatography column and you will leave lots of matrix deposits on your mass spectrometer. So therefore you need to remove matrix components such as proteins, phospholipids and red blood cells. So this will lead to a lower background signal, improved sensitivity of your assay and also reduced variation in signal. And this will all lead to a better assay. The preferred sample preparation method is simple, fast, inexpensive, and reliable. And in the next slide, I uh, have listed four of the most commonly used sample preparation methods. So it's diluted shoot, protein precipitation, uh, liquid liquid extraction, and solid phase extraction. There are multiple commercial uh, variants available. Uh, for these methods, but over here I'll just discuss the basic concepts of, uh, of each of these methods. Now, diluted shoot and protein precipitation uh, are the most simple and cheapest methods that are out there, but these are also relatively dirty compared with the other extraction methods, um, because those methods will remove more matrix components and it will leave you with a cleaner sample. Another benefit of the extraction methods um, is the ability to concentrate the sample because you can evaporate the sample and reconstitute it in a lower volume and this will increase the sensitivity of your assay. Extraction methods, however, are also uh, more time consuming and especially solid phase extraction is relatively more costly than uh, diluted shoot and protein precipitation. But let's take a close look at each of these methods. When your matrix has a low protein content, then it's relatively clean. And so you can apply the diluted shoot method. Here's an example of an assay 
that was used to measure uh, TMAO and its metabolite TMA in human urine collected over a 24 hour time period. So it starts here with 10 microliters of urine sample that is mixed with uh, 990 microliters of internal standard solution. I'll discuss later what an internal standard is. But after mixing this solution, it is injected directly into the LC LCMS system and the analytes are detected. So this is a very simple and fast, straightforward uh, sample preparation technique. When a uh, matrix contains more proteins, then protein precipitation is a better method. Um, sample of matrices with high protein content is serum, plasma, or whole blood. Protein precipitation works by mixing the sample with three to five times the volume with organic solvents, such as methanol or acetonitrile. And these organic solvents will precipitate proteins in your sample. So this, in this example, methanol is added to a plasma sample. After vortexing and centrifuging, a protein pellet is formed at the very bottom of your tube. And then you will be able to isolate uh, the supernatant, which contains the analyte, and inject the supernatant into the LC system. When you need a cleaner sample or you need a more sensitive assay, then liquid-liquid uh, extraction uh, can be used. Liquid-liquid extraction involves the partitioning of the analyte uh, from an aqueous biofluid, such as plasma, into water immiscible organic solvent. And this is all based on polarity. And this works well with neutral and nonpolar small molecules. So here in this example, uh, the analyte is indicated by stars. And a water immiscible organic solvent is added, uh, such as ethyl acetate. Typically, you would use organic solvent with a density that's lower than water, so the organic layer will stay on top. Because of the affinity of the analyte for the organic phase, uh, it will move to the organic layer. Then you can freeze your samples, so the water phase will be frozen, and you can just pour off the organic, uh, organic layer, evaporate it, and reconstitute it in reconstitution solvent. Now, this procedure consists of, of many steps. Um, it's quite labor uh, intensive. So if you're having a large number of samples, then and this may not be the preferred method for you. In that case, solid phase extraction may be better because it's easier to automate this, this process. So solid phase extraction. Um, uses a difference of affinity between an analyte and interference for a solid phase, also called a sorbent. Here is the example of uh, solid phase columns, and they're also available in a 96 well plate format. So it all starts with conditioning the column with the conditioning solvent, and then you will load your sample. The analyte in your sample will absorb to the uh, to the stationary phase while the interfering components will just flow through to the waste after several washing steps you can then elute your analyte from the column by an element and there is a possibility to evaporate this uh, solution and reconstitute it now there are several types of sorbents available depending on the characteristics of your analyte. For a polar analyte, also the sorbent should be polar. For example, a city pair column can then be used. A nonpolar C18 uh, sorbent are uh, applicable for a nonpolar analyte and for charged molecules, ion exchange SBE columns are available. Now, before uh, 
doing the sample preparation uh, steps, it is important to add an internal standard if you're doing a liquid chromatography um, assays because um, you need to control for variability that can occur during sample preparation, HPLC injection and ionization. An internal standard is added at a fixed concentration to calibration standards, quality control samples, and your study samples before you do your um, sample preparation. The preferred internal standard is a stable isotope labeled compound, such as a carbon 13 or a deuterated version of your analyte. If these are not available or too expensive, then a structurally similar analog can be used. You want to have an internal standard that's structurally very similar to your analyte because it should exhibit um, similar behavior in terms, of, in, in terms of a similar extraction recovery, a similar chromatic graphic retention time, and also a similar ionization response as the analyte. You will use the peak area of the internal standard to uh, normalize the response of your analyte. So the area ratio is uh, used as the outcome of your, um, of your chromatographic assay as shown over here. So for example, if there is any loss of your analyte during, uh, during extraction, then also your peak area of the, the internal standard will decrease you know, to a similar extent and your area ratio wouldn't, wouldn't change. And this will uh, greatly improve the precision of your method. Here's an example of an internal standard that we used when we developed an assay uh, for the quantitation of serafinib in human plasma. Um, we use a carbon-13 and a deuterated version of, of serafinib. Um, so this part of the molecule is the only difference with uh, with the analyte, the rest is similar. And we can see uh, here in the chromatograms that the chromatographic behavior is very, very similar. The retention time is almost the same. So this is a type of um, internal standard that you would prefer for your assay. After sample preparation, you need to separate the analyte from any other components that are still there in your matrix very often. Uh, sample or analyzed separation is performed by liquid chromatography. Here you see a schematic overview of uh, an LC system coupled with a mass spectrometer as the detector. So your sample is injected over here using an auto sampler and after injection it gets mixed with the mobile phase consisting of solvent A and solvent B. Uh, for reversed phase methods, I'll uh, shortly discuss what that is. Uh, solvent A is typically um, an aqueous solvent, while solvent B is an organic water miscible solvent, such as methanol or acetonitrile. So the separation principle of liquid chromatography is based on the distribution of the analyte between the mobile phase and the stationary phase, which is the packing material of the LC column. Each component in the sample uh, interacts differently with the adsorbent material of the stationary phase. So just to give you an example, um, this is a nonpolar uh, stationary phase that is used to uh, retain nonpolar analytes. So we see here that the polar uh, molecules in your sample, they will be retained less strongly by your stationary phase and they will travel through the color more quickly. So they will uh, elude earlier in time. Whereas the analyte will have more interaction with the stationary phase and will move slower, slower through the column and will be detected at a later point in time. So these differences in binding affinity to the stationary phase leads to separation of the analyte. 
Now, in the next slide, um, over here, you see that there are different types of liquid chromatography methods. There is high performance or high pressure liquid chromatography, HPLC. And the other subtype is ultra high performance or pressure liquid chromatography, UHPLC. Differences between these methods are shown over here. Uh, UHPLC columns uh, have a smaller column particle size, less than two micrometers. So these columns can be run at a much higher pressure. This results in a shorter runtime. And also the resolution is higher, meaning that the peaks are, are narrower compared to HPLC methods. Disadvantages of UHPLC methods um, are that it's more costly. The instrument is more expensive. Only the highest grade of solvents can, can be used and maintenance should also be uh, carried out more frequently. And HPLC methods are also more robust than UHPLC methods. So each of these methods um, has their advantages, but also their disadvantages. Now, there are different types of HPLC and UHPLC columns on the market because there are several ways that an analyte can be retained in the column. So first, there is a separation based on polarity. Um, so for nonpolar analytes, also the stationary phase of the column needs to be nonpolar. This is the case for reverse phase columns. In reverse phase columns, um, large alkyl chains are bonded to the stationary phase particles, as, as shown here. For polar analytes, also a polar stationary phase should be used. And so you would then have a silica column as shown over here. For charge analytes, um, you can um, carry out ion exchange chromatography. So in this example, the uh, analyte is a negatively charged uh, molecule and it's bonded by positively charged beads in the stationary phase. So uh, any positively charged uh, molecules in, uh, in your sample will just go through directly to the waste because they won't interact with the, uh, with the stationary phase. And by applying a salt gradient or um, increasing the pH, you will then be able to elute the negatively charged ions and um, yeah, process the sample further for, for detection. Another separation technique is uh, size exclusion chromatography. Here, the stationary phase uh, or the column is packed with fine porous beads. And these beads have different sizes and only the smallest molecules will be captured by these beads and the larger molecules will flow through um, and be you know, eluded sooner in time compared to the smaller molecules. Carbo columns um, are also out there when your analyte contains several enantiomers. So chiral in chiral columns, a um, enantiomer of a chiral compound is bonded to the stationary phase. And the enantiomers in your sample will have different uh, binding affinities for this enantiomer. So in this example, you see this, this upper enantiomer will bind more strongly and will be retained longer compared to this enantiomer. Now let's move on to the mobile phase because here there are also a couple of variations possible because uh, you can change the composition uh, of mobile phase A and B. If the composition remains constant throughout your method, and then this is called isocratic elution, as shown over here. Um, this graph shows you uh, a chromatogram for uh, 
an LCU free method to detect theobromine, theophylline, and caffeine. And we see that caffeine, the peak of caffeine occurs later in time because uh, caffeine is more uh, nonpolar than the other two compounds. This is a reversed phase method, by the way. You can, however, reduce the runtime by gradually increasing the percentage of B, uh, meaning that your mobile phase will become more and more nonpolar over time, thereby forcing nonpolar compounds such as caffeine earlier from, from the column. So, so caffeine will elute early in time, making um, the runtime shorter than an isocratic dilution method. So gradient dilution is a good method when a sample contains components of a wide range of polarities. Well, after having discussed sample preparation and analyzed separation, let's move on to analyte detection. Nowadays, mass spectrometry is the most widely used detection method. So I'll primarily focus on that method. However, still many labs use UV or fluorescent detection, so I'll also shortly discuss that technique. There are several UV detectors available, such as a variable wavelength detector or a diode array detector. In the next slide, I will show you how a diode array detector works. Here, a deuterium lamp emits polychromatic light in the UV phase region, and it will flow through the flow cell. And the flow cell is connected directly to the output of the HPLC column. So in the flow cell, the analyte will absorb light, and any transmitted light will hit a grating, which disperses the light onto a diode array element, which uh, measures the intensity of light at each wavelength. So you would then be able to generate a UV spectrum while also uh, generating a chromatogram at the same time. UV detectors are very reliable and easy to use. Uh, disadvantages are that, well, that they only work for analytes with chromophoric activity, meaning that the analyte should have conjugated double bounds as you can see here for beta-carotene and benzoic acid. Also, if compounds have the same chromophores, then it can be difficult to distinguish these because they'll generate the same UV spectrum. So specificity and also sensitivity is less compared with mass spectrometry methods. And therefore, um, MS detectors are nowadays the detectors of choice. So let's move on to MS. An MS machine consists of three components, the ion source to ionize sample, a mass analyzer, which will separate the ions, and finally a detector. And here you see a selection of uh, widely used ion source and mass analyzers. So let's first discuss electrospray ionization. Here, the sample is ionized in the liquid phase. So uh, here, the sample will be introduced from the LC column and a high voltage is applied. Um, and here uh, in the spraying nozzle, uh, charged droplets are being formed. Ionization can be carried out in a positive ion mode, which uh, generates uh, protonated molecules, whereas also negative ion mode can be carried out in which your analyte will become deprotonated. Now, over here um, in this process, charged droplets are being formed and Eventually, the solvent in the droplets will evaporate, so droplets will become smaller and smaller in size um, due to repulsive forces between the charges. 
the droplets will become even sm smaller uh, until a droplet only contains one single analyte. So the smallest uh, droplets will then be uh, separated in the next stage. Atmospheric pressure chemical ionization um, is more effective in, ion in ionizing less polar and smaller analytes than electrospheric ionization. Here, ionization occurs in the gas phase. So HPLC effluent flows uh, through the nebulizer probe, which is also heated to temperatures up to 500 degrees Celsius. The effluent is evaporated completely, and then it enters the ionization region where a corona discharge needle ionizes the samples. And this can be also carried out in positive or negative ion modes. And this entire process is done under atmospheric pressure. And the um, ion separation uh, processes later on will be carried out uh, under high vacuum conditions. When you're dealing with uh, macromolecules such as peptides or proteins that are, that are non-volatile and, and fragile, then MALDI, matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization, is an appropriate ionization method. Uh, MALDI is a softer technique than electrospray ionization or APCI, um, so that causes less fragmentation of the analyte in the ion source. So for MALDI, uh, the sample is first mixed with the UV absorbing matrix on a metal plate. Here you see uh, commonly used MALDI matrices. And what happens next is that a laser will be um, directed onto the sample. This will irradiate and desorb the sample um, containing analyte and also your MALDI matrix. Your analyte will then become ionized and elect an electrostatic field will be applied, which will accelerate the ions into the mass analyzer. And typically um, the detector is, uh, that's commonly used with MALDI is the time of flight detector as shown over here. It's a tube of approximately one meter in length with a detector here at the top. And the time of flight is the measure of time that ions need to cross the tube and make it to the detector. And here, uh, low mass ions will reach the detector faster than high mass ions. So this will lead to separation of the ions. Now, another mass analyzer, and perhaps the most uh, well-known and widely used in bioanalysis, is the triple quadruple instrument. Uh, a quadruple is a set of four metal rods, and a triple quadruple is three sets of them in a row. So this is Q1, Q2, and Q3. So if we take a closer look at these rods, um, they are arranged parallel to one another and opposite rod pairs are connected electrically. A radio frequency voltage with the direct current offset voltage is applied between one pair and another. Um, and this will create positive and negative charges that are alternating. And this all leads to an oscillating electric field in which only ions of a certain mass to charge ratio will be able to travel through the rods. These are the so-called resonant ions. Um, other uh, ions will have unstable trajectories such as the blue one over here, and it will collide with one of the rods and will not make it through the next stage, which is the collision cell. Now the resonant ions that will be that will enter the collision cell will be bombarded by neutral gas molecules such as argon or nitrogen, and here fragments will be created, and these fragments will then be um, selected in the next mass analyzer at Q3, and only the resonant fragment ions will make it to the ion detector. So here's an example of 
a, a molecule with a massive charge ratio of 255. After fragmentation, only this fragment will be selected and detected. There are several types of scan methods that can be uh, carried out with a uh, with an MSMS uh, machine. So without fragmentation, you can do a full scan in which compounds of every mass are plotted against time. A more um, specific way of um, you know, selecting ions is to do a selective ion monitoring scan in which the MS is set to scan over a very small mass range. For quantitation purposes, uh, multiple reaction monitoring is most often carried out. Here you specifically monitor a transition from a, a parent ion to a specific fragment ion. And normally you would just see one peak in your chromatogram. So this is a very specific and also very sensitive scan method. Now the last uh, type of mass analyzer I'll discuss is the ion trap. As the name suggests, this instrument is used to trap ions inside the mass analyzer by using electric or magnetic fields. Um, here you see the different types of ion traps that are out there. For the sake of time, I will only highlight the linear ion trap, which is shown over here. So here, uh, the linear ion trap is uh, a set of three quadrupolar rods. Um, so there are three sections, the front, the center, and the back section. And ions are trapped by an electric field. They are confined uh, radially by a two-dimensional uh, radio frequency field uh, that's created by an alternating current. Um, and this current is applied to all of these three segments. In the actual direction, a uh, direct current potential is applied and um, this will create a so-called potential well. And this also makes sure that the ions cannot escape the ion trap. Here's an example of how a trap ion would, would look like. Now you can use the ion trap as a selection device by uh, capturing only the ions of interest and ejecting the ions that are not important for your analysis. You can eject ions by gradually increasing the radio frequency voltage, which makes uh, the ions uh, unstable. So then they will be able to, to leave the trap through one of the eject ejection slits. The trap ions can be uh, characterized further by, uh, by fragmentation. You can do this by introducing a collision gas such as helium. And well, this process of ejection and fragmentation can be, can be repeated several times. And this is called multi-stage fragmentation. So here's an example of a multi-stage fragmentation experiment. Um, here the drug Bosantan is being fragmented. It has a parent mass to charge ratio of 552. Um, after fragmentation, um, four uh, fragments are observed in this product ion scan. And each of these four fragments can then again be isolated and fragmented. So you would then be able to obtain these MS3 spectra, which are shown over here for the three major fragments. Most commercial instruments uh, can repeat this uh, process several times, sometimes to the 10th or the 11th level. And this is a very useful um, instrument for qualitative analysis. For example, if you need to identify uh, metabolites of the drug. So we just discussed several mass analyzer. Uh, it is possible to combine these analyzers to increase the functional capabilities of your method. Um, just to give you an idea, this figure shows you uh, commonly used hybrid configurations in bioanalysis. So the simplest configuration is uh, tandem mass spectrometry with the three quarter poles. 
in some machines, the third particle can also function as a linear ion trap. So then you have a particle linear ion trap. And here are just some other examples of uh, other combinations. Now, I just want to make sure that uh, everyone understands the difference between a chromatogram and a mass spectra. So I'll therefore show you this graph. A chromatogram shows the retention time on the horizontal axis and peak intensity on the y-axis. So it shows you the chromatographic separation of your analyze over time. At each moment in time, um, you can also look at the different mass to charge ratio that are present. And then you'll have a mass spectrum um, where you have the mass to charge ratios on the horizontal axis and still on the vertical axis, the peak intensity. So a mass spectrum shows you which ions are uh, most abundant at a certain point in time. And this spectrum can be used to elucidate the uh, chemical identity or structure of your compounds. So we just discussed chromatographic assays uh, for large molecules such as proteins and peptides. Ligand binding assays can also be used for quantitation in biological matrices. So in these assays, uh, quantitation is based on the analyzed affinity for a ligand, such as an antibody or an antigen. Uh, there are differences with chromatographic assays. For example, very often it's hard to isolate these large molecules from the matrix. Therefore, ligand binding assays are often run without uh, separating the analyte from the matrix. Also, the analyte is measured indirectly by uh, monitoring the binding reaction with assay reagents. And the dynamic range of assays, of these ligand binding assays, are narrower than uh, chromatographic assays. Here we see the different ligand binding assay platforms. The widely used and well known ELISA is the most commonly used platform. And within the ELISA platform, there are several subtypes, such as di direct, competitive, centrage, and the bridge ELISA. Uh, in the next slide, I will highlight how a sandwich ELISA works. So here, the wells of the ELISA plate are pre-coded with a capturing antibody. Then when the sample is, is added, the analytes will be captured by this antibody. And the next step is to add a second conjugated antibody shown over here. And this second antibody will bind to the analyte uh, at a different binding site. So you will create basically a sandwich. The conjugated enzyme is very often uh, horse radish peroxidase. And after adding its substrate, TMB, a blue color formation will be observed. This reaction will be stopped by an acid stop solution and the blue color will uh, turn into yellow. And the intensity of the yellow color can be measured on a plate reader at 450 nanometers. So for each experiment, a calibration curve will be uh, generated. And well, after measuring your study samples, you can back calculate the absorbance uh, to the concentration and you would have your results. A sandwich ELISA is, is very specific because the uh, capturing and the detection steps require very unique epitope recognition to generate an assay signal. All right. So after completing method development, you need to assess the performance of your assay. And this will be done during validation. I will already apologize because this is a very boring topic, but it's also very important. And therefore I think you should know about this. So bioanalytical method validation 
uh, is based on procedures and criteria outlined uh, in the FDA guidance. The last version of the guidance was published in 2018, and it's required for pivotal studies uh, that are submitted in drug applications that need uh, regulatory decision making. During method validation, several questions are addressed, such as uh, will, the measure, will the method measure the intended analytes? So specificity and selectivity are validation parameters. What's the variability with the measurements and also how accurate are the, are the measurements? Uh, what's the range of your essay that provides reliable data? And how stable uh, is the analyte during sample collection, sample handling and storage? So several stability experiments will be done. Here you see uh, several validation parameters and there are also uh, some post-validation runs that I will cover in the next section. So first, I will explain to you the difference between calibrators and quality control samples, QCs. Calibrators, uh, it's basically biological matrix to which a known amount of analyte uh, has been added. And these samples are used to construct calibration curves um, as shown over the year, which run from the LLOQ to the ULOQ, the upper limit of quantitation. Calibrators need to be prepared freshly before each run. Um, and then the quality control samples, uh, these are also uh, biological uh, matrix samples to which a known amount of analyte has been spiked. And these samples are used to monitor the accuracy and precision of the method and also determine the stability of the samples. Quality control samples, uh, they span the uh, calibration curve. So QC samples need to be prepared at the very at the lowest level, the LLQ. Then there are QCs at the lower range of the curve, mid-range, and at, at, the, at the higher range. And these QC samples need to be prepared at least uh, freshly for, for one run. Then it is acceptable, acceptable to freeze a batch of QC samples and thaw uh, subsets of these samples for subsequent validation runs. Calibrators and QCs are prepared from separate stock solutions uh, that are prepared by doing separate weighings. And they must go through the exact same sample preparation procedure as the study samples. Here, you, know, you see listed the FDA, FDA criteria for the calibration curve uh, for both chromatographic assays and ligand binding assays. For the sake of time, I will you know, primarily focus uh, on the chromatographic criteria. Uh, if you are interested in the ligand binding criteria, please feel free to review these tables uh, at your own pace or read the FDA guidance. Um, but for now, let me just discuss the chromatographic uh, criteria. So categories that need to be included are uh, blank samples that contain no analyte and no internal standards, a zero calibrator, which only contains internal standards, and then at least six non-zero calibrators need to be run, uh, ranging from the lower limit of quantitation up to the upper limit. Calibration curves for chromatographic assays are typically uh, linear, and you should use the simplest regression method as possible. If a non-weighted regression uh, doesn't work, then it is possible to uh, use a weighted regression method as shown over here. 75% of calibrators and a minimum of six non-zero calibrators need to be within 15% of the nominal concentration. The lower limit of uh, quantitation uh, sample can uh, deviate um, at the maximum of 20%. 
calibration curve for ligand binding assays are typically nonlinear. So a four or five parameter logistic metal model is, is used. And well, the other criteria for calibrators and ligand binding assays are shown up here. So let's move on to accuracy and precision. Precision uh, is a measure of how closely the measurement results are to each other. So in this example, uh, precision is very good, but accuracy is poor because accuracy shows the proximity of the results to the true value. So you want to have a method that's both precise and accurate. Um, so you want to have this this, uh, this this result. Accuracy and precision uh, need to be validated in at least three independent runs for chromatographic assays. In each run, four QC levels need to be included, and there need to be at least five replicates um, at each level. The concentrations that are measured need to be within 15 or 20% of the nominal values, and also precision need to be within 15 or 20%. Selectivity and specificity uh, will assess how well the analyte can be detected and measured in the presence of other matrix components that can be both endogenous and exogenous, such as other drugs that uh, a patient may be using. So when validating a selectivity, uh, at least uh, matrix from six individual sources need to be spiked with the analyte at the LLQ. And the values, the concentrations need to be within 20% of the nominal value. Also, there shouldn't be any interference at the retention time of the analyte and internal standards. And the response of the internal standard need to be uh, pretty consistent. So within 5% of the average IS response in calibrators and QCs. Uh, in ligand binding assays, at least 10 individual sources need to be tested. And these should also include uh, lipemic or hemolyzed samples. And then additional QC levels is also validated for ligand binding assays. So specificity then, it uh, focuses on the interference of uh, cross-reacting molecules, other drugs that may be present or metabolized in your samples. Here, um, you will spike samples that contain any of these expected interfering components, and you spike these samples with your analyte at the LLQ, and results should again be within 20% of the nominal values. And well, the interference and the IS response criteria are similar as what I showed you in the previous slide on selectivity. Carryover can be a big problem uh, in liquid chromatography method. It happens when there are leftovers of the analyte somewhere in the chromatic somewhere in the chromatographic system, which can be the column or the sampling needle in the auto sampler. And you will observe carryover when you see a peak in a blank sample directly after injection of a high concentration sample. And this has negative impact on the accuracy of your measurement. Uh, therefore, you should uh, minimize carryover during method development. So the FDA criterion on carryover is that uh, a peak in a blank sample after injection of a high concentration sample should not exceed 20% of the response of an LLQ sample. So this, in this example, you see that there's a very small peak in, in the blank sample, which is well below the 20% response of, of an LLQ peak. So this is an acceptable, acceptable result with regard to carryover. Now, recovery describes the efficiency of your extraction method, how much loss is observed. And it is calculated by dividing the response of extracted samples by post extraction blanks that are spiked with the analyte. So, this number represents 100% recovery. 
a recovery doesn't need to be uh, very high or it doesn't need to be 100%. More importantly is that it is consistent and reproducible and it needs to be validated at at least three QC levels. Then uh, there are several stability experiments that need to be carried out. Benched up stability, which assesses stability in an unprocessed sample. Then processed sample stability, stability after three freeze thaw cycles. Uh, stock solution stability and long term stability experiments will need to be carried out. And um, QC. Uh, concentration at the low and the high level uh, should be within 15% of the nominal concentrations. Well, after successful assay validation, you can go ahead and run your study samples. You typically run the samples in the following order. First, calibrators need to be injected, followed by study samples by default in chron chronological order. And then lastly, QCs will be uh, injected. At least 75% and a minimum of six non-zero calibrators need to pass, meaning that uh, non-zero calibrators need to be within 15% uh, of the nominal values and LLQ QCs need to be within 20%. For the QCs, uh, at least 67% need to be within the 15% uh, range and per QC level, more than half of the QCs also need to be within 15%. You will also look at potential interference because there shouldn't be uh, any interfering peaks at the retention time of the analyte and internal standard. If results are below the LLQ, these should be reported as BQL. If concentrations are higher than your calibration curve, then you need to dilute and reanalyze the samples. Another option is to extend and revalidate the standard curve. To verify the reliability of reported analyzed concentrations in study samples, a portion of the study samples are reanalyzed, and this is called incurred sample reanalysis or ISR. And this is expected for new drug applications. So for ISR, 10% uh, of the first 1,000 samples need to be reanalyzed, uh, and 5% will be reanalyzed of any remaining samples. And samples will be selected around the maximum concentration and also in the elimination phase. So you will then do the following calculation. Um, you will subtract the original concentration from the repeated measurement and divide this by the mean value of, uh, of, of both values and multiply this by 100%. This will give you the difference, percentage of difference uh, from the mean values. So for chromatographic assay, 67% of the samples need to be within 20% of the mean. And uh, for ligand binding assays, um, well, for 67% of the samples, they should be within 30% of this mean value. There are different types of validation. If you do all validation experiments, then you'll do a full validation. Also partial validation is uh, possible which can vary between uh, just doing one accuracy and precision one up to a nearly full validation. Partial validation needs to be done when a method is being transferred between labs or when there are any changes in, for example, um, an analytical detector, a change in sample preparation procedures, or if sample volume or matrix uh, changed slightly. Another type of validation is cross-validation, which is done when two different analytical methods are used to generate data for the same study. Or you can also have this situation in which um, two or more labs use the same method to generate results 
for one single study. So then you need to assess interlaboratory reliability. Cross validation is carried out by analyzing a shared set of QC samples. Um, and it's also, to pos to, it's also possible to analyze non-pooled or pooled subject samples. And the difference between the test method and the reference method um, should be very close to, to each other um, to pass the requirements for cross-validation. It is important to note that it's not always necessary to, or feasible to conduct a full FDA validation. Most importantly is that the level of validation needs to be appropriate for the intended purpose of the study. So if you're doing an exploratory study, then you can have less stringent validation requirements. So you could get away with a reduced number of analytical runs or replicates, or also uh, include the reduced numbers of validation parameters. Now then about uh, ligand binding assays, because these are uh, often available as commercial kits. And these kits, they were typically designed to diagnose a condition in patients. And later on, they were repurposed to measure analyte concentration, concentration pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies. Sometimes these kits are fine and don't require additional validation, but sometimes you need to do additional validation runs. For example, if the calibration curve only consists of one or two calibration points, or if the actual QC concentrations are not known, because concentration ranges are not acceptable. Additional validation is also needed if calibrators and QCs are prepared in a matrix that's different from your study samples or if the reference standard is different from the analyte in your samples. So then you need to do additional validation experiments. So let me uh, end with an example of how we developed uh, an essay at Russell Park for enzalutamide in human plasma. Enzalutamide um, is an oral drug used in the treatment of castration-resistant prostate cancer. It competitively inhibits androgen binding to the androgen receptor. And we developed this assay in support of a phase 1b study in which enzalutamide was given with or without serafinib in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. At the time of assay development, uh, there were already three published assays. And so these were pretty helpful for us in the assay development process. Here you see the metabolism of enzalutamide. It's metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzymes in the liver uh, to um, the M6 metabolite, which then is being metabolized into N-desmethyl enzalutamide, or M2. And this is the major active metabolite. Therefore, we included also this metabolite in our assay. As we normally do for drug assays in plasma, we use one of our triple quadruple mass spectrometers. And uh, protein precipitation was used here as the sample preparation method. So 50 microliters of plasma was mixed with 200 microliters of uh, working solution that contained the internal standard. We used um, the structurally analog apalutamide uh, as the internal standard, because uh, radio-labeled enzalutamide was not, uh, wasn't stable in our lab. So after vortex mixing and centrifuging, uh, supernatant was transferred to a 96 well plate. Then samples were diluted, vortex mixed, centrifuged, and finally one microliter was injected into the LCMS system. Enzalutamide is a nonpolar compound, therefore we carried out the first phase chromatography using a C18 column. Here we see the composition of the mobile phases and we applied gradient dilution. Total run time was uh, nine minutes.
so ionization of uh, the sample was done um, using electrospray ionization in the positive ion mode. And here you see the transitions that were monitored. Um, and just to give you an example, the fragmentation pattern of enzalidomide is, is shown over here. And we monitored the 209 fragments. So here you see the chromatograms at the lower limit of quantitation, 10 nanograms per mil. And salutamide eluded at 3.0 minutes. And desmethyl and salutamide is uh, slightly more polar, therefore eludes a little bit earlier at 2.9 minutes. And the internal standard had a and redemption time that was pretty close to that of enzalutamide, 3.2 minutes. Here you see an output of the mass spec software um, showing you the calibration curve of enzalutamide running from 10 up to 20,000 nanograms per mil. And here are the validation results. So for accuracy and precision, four QC levels were tested. And we see for enzalutamide that the precision represented by CV percent was uh, within 20 and within 15 percent. And also deviation from nominal concentration were also well within the 15 or the 20 percent requirement. And similar results were observed for, uh, for the metabolite. So accuracy and precision were validated. Selectivity was uh, assessed by spiking blank plasma samples from six individual sources. And we see at the LLQ that deviations from nominal concentrations were well within the 20% requirements. And also we didn't see interferences in the blank samples at the retention time of enzalutamide and the metabolite and internal standards. Then recovery. Uh, recovery for both analytes was consistent and was very high, greater than 95% at all QC levels. And um, this was also true for the metabolite. And we can also see that the variability between samples was also very, very low. So recovery was consistent and reproducible. And finally, uh, the stability results, we see that uh, after doing bench stop, stability, process sample stability, and uh, stability after pre freeze thaw cycles, we see that for the low and the high QC levels, the deviation from normal concentrations were all within the 15% requirement. And also for the metabolites, deviation from normal were all within 15%. So, in conclusion, this assay was validated successfully and was used to measure samples of the interaction study. I would like to conclude uh, with these uh, figures showing you what you can actually do with a validated assay. Because the uh, concentrations that will be uh, measured can be used to generate these concentration time curves as shown here for enzalutamide and the metabolite. And these concentration curves are very handy to obtain important pharmacokinetic parameters, such as the area under the curve, which uh, gives you uh, a measurement or an indication of the systemic exposure of the drug. You can read off the uh, maximum plasma concentration and the terminal slope can also be used to uh, calculate the elimination half-life. So this concludes my talk. Um, I hope you now have a better understanding of the importance of bioanalysis, the different uh, types of assays and the process of assay development and validation. Please direct any questions you have on this lecture to the course directors. And thank you very much for your attention.